Hi, and welcome to our show, Forever Paranormal, with your host, Dr. Bill and Ed, where we will discuss such things as cryptids, UFOs, hauntings, angels, unsolved mysteries, government conspiracies and cover-ups, witchcraft, the metaphysical, and more, as well as stories sent in by you, our listeners. If we can connect a paranormal element to it, we'll talk about it. And you may be surprised by what all is connected to the paranormal. Please don't forget to follow, rate, and share the show, since it would not be possible without you, our listeners. And as a public service, we would like to let everyone know that you are truly never alone, even if you think you are. The Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is 988. Just reach out. Hi everyone, and welcome to this episode, where we are going to discuss the possibility of past lives and reincarnation. Hi Deb, are you ready to start discussing this subject? Hi, how are you? I'm great, you? Good, how's the crow situation? I think it's getting a little bit better. Good. Oh. Are you ready to start discussing this? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I wasn't going to let you get away without answering that question. You're famous for answering a question with a question. <laughs> this can be looked at from several angles, including quantum physics, universal consciousness, and multiple religions. You have to remember that everything is energy, and the amount of energy in the universe never changes. It never ends and it never makes more. It just transforms from one type of energy to another, and this energy could possibly include what we refer to as a soul. How does quantum physics play into this subject? Well, in quantum physics, you have to remember that in order for it to work, and the string theory to work, there has to be a minimum of 11 parallel universes. So it could be that reincarnation is going from one universe to another or back. So quantum physics is part of the study. So it's not just being reincarnated in this world. It could be in another. Is that what you're saying? It could be different planes, yes. Okay. Different, different planes of consciousness, different levels of consciousness, different levels of understanding and being. Which a lot of the Eastern religions believe in. You ascend to higher planes of being. So, what is reincarnation anyway? One definition describes it as a rebirth, a transmigration, or metapsychosis in a philosophical or religious concept. That the non-physical essence of a living being begins in a new life in a different physical form or body after biological death. This doesn't refer to strictly human form either. In most beliefs involving reincarnation, the soul of a human being is immortal, energy, and does not disperse after the physical body has perished. Upon death, the soul merely becomes transmigrated into a newborn baby or an animal to continue its immortality. The term transmigration means the passing of a soul from one body of to another after death. How does this transmigration work? Does the energy just float around in space looking for a body or something? Well, it's possible. And we're going to talk about that a little bit when we kind of talk about spirits and ghosts and how there could be time lapses and things like that because time is a man-made concept and we don't know what time really is in higher planes and universal consciousness. It might be non-existent. So what we think is 50 years might be a second. Okay, so when it when this takes place, does does this transmigrate into another dead body and re you know bring that body back to life or just create no, that, a no, body? No, that would be resurrection. Mm-hmm. The body is being created by someone else. A soul is just finding that body that is in creation. So it's not resurrection or anything like that. Right? So the, the energy 
the soul per se, does not create the body. It finds one. And depending on the religion or the, or the karma per the religion would determine whether it goes into a person, a horsefly, a worm, or something to that effect. Does that make sense? Oh, so you're saying it takes over what's already existing, uh, like uh, some soul supposedly can come and take over my body. Not necessarily. That'd be a possession. <laughs> A okay. soul can come take over the body of a newborn baby that is developing in the womb of a mother. Okay. So because it it's, doesn't have a soul yet. It's not born. A fetus. Right. Because, you know, it's not a baby till it's born. Right. A fetus. Because you're right. It's not a baby till it's born. <clears throat> and the soul would take over at that point. Right? Mm. Here are the major religions that believe in reincarnation in one form or another. Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, and the Orphic mystery religion. While the majority of denominations within Christianity and Islam do not believe in reincarnation, certain groups within these religions do refer to reincarnation, such as the mainstream historical and contemporary followers of Cathars, Alawites, the Druze, and the Rosicrucians. However, in this episode, we are going to focus more on past lives than various religions. You say Christians in Islam do not believe in reincarnation, yet they believe in resurrection? I'm, I'm, I know. It's not for this episode, so I'll move on. For the sake of argument, what about the Holy Spirit? Perhaps it's just energy floating around waiting for an entity to transmigrate to? No. The Holy Spirit would be up on the highest level of planes. It's not going back to learn anything. It already has everything. It already knows everything. It already is everything. So it wouldn't be going back to learn another lesson. It's not going to transmigrate. And as far as reincarnation and resurrection... Reincarnation is where your soul transforms into something other living being. Resurrection is where your body comes back. I that, know. Both are unbelievable. Why don't they believe in well, that's both? Your, that's your opinion. Okay. And, and both can't be the same thing because they're two completely different things. So, but let's, you know, you, you mentioned the Holy Spirit. So let's look at ghosts and spirits. My belief is that is energy that is not finished with its lesson in life and is not ready to pass on yet. This could possibly be one of the states, like in Jainism, where your energy goes to different planes depending on your karma. This could also explain what appears to be some time slips between the periods of time to the now of the remembrance as to when the past life they lived actually occurred. There has been documented cases from a half century to thousands of years in between. This could also explain why some spirits are not able to be called upon and why others can. It is possible that those unreachable spirits have already transgressed or moved on. And like I was saying earlier, this may explain why, you know, this person was from 50 years ago, because we don't know the concept of time in universal consciousness or parallel universes. Again, time is a man-made concept. So you have different levels to pass, so to speak, before your energy can move on to another form. Another body, another form, yeah. And that's what a lot of your um, Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, believe. You have to learn your lessons. You have to keep going. You keep transforming and transmigrating up to higher levels and higher planes to your like the Holy Spirit, you're all, you're everything, your consciousness is, is above all. The remembrance of past lives seem to come in several ways, either as a child or through hypnotic past life regression. There are many recorded accounts of children remembering a past life from all over the globe. In the kids, it usually starts right around three years of age and typically goes away by the time they are six or seven. What is hypnotic past life regression? 
that's when a hypnotist puts you under and like remembering things from your childhood that you couldn't remember. And the hypnotist gets you to go into your past lives from your subconscious, from your subconscious being able to connect with the universal consciousness and the Akashic records. And you sit and talk about what or who you were. I personally don't believe that much in that because it can be influenced very strongly depending on the hypnotist. Agreed. With over 2,500 case files, the stories of the children are the main focus of a study for Jim Tucker, M.D., who heads up the University of Virginia's Division of Perceptual Studies. The Division of Perceptual Studies is a highly productive university-based research group devoted to the investigation of phenomena that challenge mainstream scientific paradigms regarding the nature of human consciousness. The researchers objectively document and carefully analyze data collected regarding extraordinary human experiences to prove through science. Probably two of the most publicized stories from UVA and Dr. Tucker are that of James Leininger and Ryan Hammonds, and are included in his book, Return to Life. Soon after little James Leininger's second birthday, he started having trouble with horrible nightmares about a fatal airplane crash and kept waking up yelling, Airplane crash! Plane on fire! Little man can't get out! He also knew details about World War II aircraft that it would seem impossible for a toddler to know. For instance, when his mother Andrea referred to an object in the bottom of a toy plane as a bomb, James corrected her by saying it was a drop tank. Another time, he and his parents were watching the History Channel documentary, and the narrator called a Japanese plane a Zero. James insisted that it was a Tony. In both cases, he was right. The boy said that he had also been named James in his previous life and that he'd flown off a ship named the Natoma. The Leiningers discovered a World War II aircraft carrier called the USS Natoma Bay. In its squadron was a pilot named James Houston, who had been killed in action over the Pacific. In other words, it seems little boy James had experienced memories of a past life. Dr. Tucker goes to a lot of explanation and periods of time in his book on this. When Ryan Hammonds was four years old, he began directing imaginary movies. Shouts of action echoed from his room on many occasions. But the play became a concern for Ryan's parents when he began waking up in the middle of the night screaming and clutching his chest, saying he dreamed his heart exploded when he was in Hollywood. His mother Cindy asked the doctor about the episodes. Night tears, the doctor said. He'll outgrow them. Then one night, as Cindy tucked Ryan into bed, Ryan suddenly took hold of Cindy's hand. Mama, he said, I think I used to be someone else. He said he remembered being in a big white house in a swimming pool. It was in Hollywood, many miles from his Oklahoma home. He said he had three sons, but he couldn't remember their names. He began to cry, asking Cindy over and over, why he couldn't remember their names. I really didn't know what to do, Cindy said. I was more in shock than anything. He was so insistent about it. After that night, he kept talking about it, he kept getting upset by not being able to remember those names. I started researching the internet about reincarnation. I even got some books from the library on Hollywood, thinking their pictures might help him, but I didn't tell anyone about it for months. One day, as Ryan and Cindy paged through one of the Hollywood books, Ryan stopped at a black and white still taken from a 1930s movie called Night After Night. Two men in the center of the picture were confronting one another. Four other men surrounded them. Cindy didn't recognize any of the faces, but Ryan pointed to one of the men in the middle. Hey, Mama, he said, that's George. We did a picture together. His finger then shot over to the man on the right wearing an overcoat and a scowl. That guy's me. I found me. I'm Marty Martin. Let's take a look at some pretty famous cases of reincarnation. Born in Seattle in 1991, Sonam Wangdu was only two years old when he realized he was actually the fourth reincarnation 
of the original Tibetan Lama Dezing Rippenkel I. The realization was the culmination of a number of signs that had been accumulating since before the boy was even born. These included the visions of his mother and her own Lama, as well as the words of the third reincarnation of Dezing himself, Dezing Rippenkel III, who informed his accolades in 1987, the year of his death, I will be reborn in Seattle. In 1996, the boy who by then only answered to the name of Truklu Allah, which means reincarnation, left his family forever, to be raised by the monks while studying Tibetan Buddhism in Kathmandu, Nepal, and eventually became the head of a monastery there, arriving in Nepal, dressed in gold and maroon robes and riding on a luggage cart pushed by his mother, the little Lama smiled widely. When asked how long he would stay in Nepal, the little boy was very serene, almost stoic, when answering, lots of time. I'm just going to stay here a long time. And that has proven to be true. The boy is now in his 24th year of life as the fourth reincarnation of Dezen Rippenkel, the third. The first, actually. Sorry about that. So now let's talk about a famous pianist, Vladimir Levinsky. He was born David Seacombe in England in the 1930s. And he had such an innate gift for playing the piano, even as a young child, that he was able to teach himself to be a concert pianist. When he was asked about lessons, he remarked, I have no time for them. I have a technique of my own. He was so gifted, and at such a young age, that he came to recognize himself as the reincarnation of Franz Liszt, the German composer and pianist. By age 21, he was performing for packed concert halls as known as the Pagini of the Piano. Unfortunately, Levinsky's interest in Liszt at times came to border on obsession, such as when he was playing a concert on January 23, 1952, and he stopped playing halfway through to talk about Liszt. The audience was disappointed, but Levinsky, for his part, felt the concert was a tremendous success, in part because he experienced it only as the reincarnation of the renowned composer and performer Liszt could. This is another well-documented one about Shanti Devi. Born in 1926 in Delhi, India, Shanti Devi was four years old when she began telling her parents that her home wasn't in Delhi. It was 90 miles away in Mathura, where she said her husband lived. She recounted memories of having been married and later of dying from complications from childbirth. She described what her husband looked like, light skin, a wart on his cheek, reading glasses, and where his shop was located. Eventually, she revealed her past persona's husband's name, Pandit Kendath Chobi. I know I butchered that, but sorry. And it turned out that the man existed. He had lost his wife, Ludji, by from complications with the C-section she had undergone while giving birth to her son, Navneet Lal. What's more, Shanti recognized that both Pandit and Navneet on sight. There's been a couple TV documentaries about that one, too. A couple shows have covered that. And uh, so that, that one's another well-documented one. So let's move on to my personal favorite, which is of Om Seti. Dorothy Eady was born in the Blackheath area of London on January 6, 1904. When she was three years old, she fell down the stairs at home. The family doctor determined her to be dead. But an hour later, she was fine. After that, she began to have dreams of living in a large building adorned with columns. She said frequently that she wanted to go home. And when she was four, during a trip to the British Museum, she declared that her home was Egypt. She actually moved to Egypt in 1933 to be with her husband, who was Egyptian. And although the marriage ended two years later, she stayed put. She became a folklorist, a keeper of a dais temple of Seti, and a droughtswoman for the Department of Egypt Antiquities. And she believed that she had, in a past life, been a young woman named Bentrefast, an orphan who had been adopted by the Temple of Corn Mel Sultan near Abydos. 
I can't remember any ordinary life. So I think I must have been stuck in a temple, she told the New York Times in 1979. I have a vague memory of the processions, but I can remember an awful old killjoy of a high priest. She had famously deciphered ancient hieroglyphs and was able to break the code on some of the unknown types, reading them like a book. There was a lot of archaeologists that couldn't break those hieroglyphs, and she walked up to them and read them. And in 1987, several years after she died in 1981, it emerged that she also believed that in her past life, she had been a lover of King Seti, who became pregnant. She said that she had died by suicide rather than reveal that the king had fathered a child with her. There does appear to be one common factor in past life memories. And that is, the person in the past life died a tragic death unexpected, or violent manner. Not all of them, of course, but the vast majority of them. So, why was that one your favorite? Om Seti is my favorite because this is a young girl. Remember, Dr. Tucker talks about past life memories are usually in children. It's coming around about three and going away about six or seven. But this is a young girl who fell down the stairs and died. She was dead for an hour, and then came back as Om Seti. As she got older, she progressed into Om Seti and never went back to being Dorothy. She moved to Egypt, stayed there the rest of her life. She left her life as an English-born child. Um, I think it's just fascinating that an hour later, she was someone else after she was declared dead. All right, Deb, so I know... We've heard a couple of your opinions on different things, and I respect those, and so does everyone else. But where do you stand on this subject? What is your opinion on this? Well, from my perspective, I can't understand how, first of all, children of the age of two, three, and four years old can even make connections that they're dreaming or thinking there's someone else from a past life or whatever. And I can't explain why people can remember things that happened to someone else in another life anyway, but I still hold true in my belief, my opinion, that we are born, we live, we die. That's it. It's sad, but logical to me. I understand that, and I respect that. And you may be right. But let's talk about the children for a minute. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in, in my research, one of the reasons that the children can remember these things is they just have dreams, and they talk about their dreams, right? And they say that we don't remember our childhoods before five or six years old that from the time we're toddlers up through that age group, we lose all that memory. Um, we, we don't have it. We don't retain it. So that might be when the spirit and the body are coming into its own, and it's becoming the person we grow up to be. So that could be a possible explanation for that. But yeah. again, that's my opinion. But two and three years old can barely form sentences, let alone associate themselves with a past life, say, come out and tell their parents, I lived another life. I don't know how a child that young can associate with that at all. I, I think that's just Or know it. the word. Most children can't. And most children don't know words like that, portals or sentences or... So most, you're right, most kids can't. So that's what gives it some credibility with the ones that can that say they remember a past life. They've got a greater vocabulary. They've got a greater understanding of the language, whether it's English or Indian or whatever, but they do. Hmm. So what about you, folks? Our contact info is in the show notes, and we'd love to hear what you think about this subject. And as always, we couldn't do this without you. So thanks for listening. And until next time, we discuss another tale yet to be told. 
Thank you for listening, and remember to like and share the show. We would also appreciate a five-star rating wherever possible to help new listeners find the show. We welcome all questions or comments you may have about this or any other episode, and our contact information can be found in the show notes of this episode. You can also follow us at foreverparanormal.com. And if you'd like to support us, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash foreverparanormal. The links to these are also in the show notes of this episode. Thank you.